Our scripture reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, which happens to be the whole of that chapter. Revelation chapter 10, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. And his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets." Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So far, the reading from God's word. Let's look to the Lord our God in prayer. Father, as we open your word this morning and turn our hearts to you, we pray that you would give us understanding that, Lord, you would speak by your spirit through words written down so long ago, but written down for us, Father, that we may understand who you are, that we may understand that your, king, your son is king of kings and lord of lords, enthroned on Zion, your holy mountain. And that, Father, we may come and worship the one who is the faithful witness and the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of all the kings on earth, Jesus Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. So we have been working our way through the book of Revelation, and I know I have noted this many times already, and I will probably note it many times in the weeks to come, but what we really need to be looking for in every text that we come to in this book is essentially a portrait a picture of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. So that complicates things a bit because there's always this tendency when we're kind of preaching through a book to divide scripture into smaller pieces so that we can deal with them more efficiently and in shorter sermons. But sometimes to see that portrait of Jesus as it's unveiled for us in the book of Revelation, we end up taking some bigger bites. Sometimes that picture is painted with broad strokes and on a really large canvas, and in order to see them, we have to step back quite a ways so that we can take in a larger quantity of text all in one sitting. That's what we were doing last week when we looked basically at all of chapters 8 and chapter 9 and all of those trumpets that were being blown and all of the things that were happening there, and we kind of came by them really quickly and then went back to where we started with this idea that everything that happens, when the seals are broken, they are broken by the Lamb of God. When the trumpets are blown, they are blown at his direction. All of the events that take place in the book of Revelation take place under the supervision and according to the will of a sovereign God who works out his purpose in all things through Christ Jesus. And so last week we saw how as the saints prayed and cried out when the fifth seal was broken, saying, how long, O Lord, until you judge the earth and avenge our blood, well, their prayers were being answered as that incense offering rose before the throne of God, before our faithful high priest who, from his position in the midst of the throne, 
always lives to make intercession for his people, for us, the people of God, as it said in Hebrews chapter 7. If we had stepped back just a bit farther and taken in even more scripture, we might have included not only the portrait of Jesus as faithful high priest, hearing the prayers of his people and interceding for them in the midst of the throne, we might also have taken in another image that's painted for us in the words of Revelation chapter 10, because these things are connected. But rather than do it all together, I thought, well, we'll, we'll take our time a little bit with this one. Because as soon as John finished with the sounding of the first six of the trumpets, he provided us in an interlude another concise depiction of Jesus. Now beginning in verse 1 of our text, he wrote, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. It's another mighty angel, because previously in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, John had seen a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. Now, On that occasion in chapter 5, the mighty angel appeared only long enough to ask the question, but here in chapter 10, another mighty angel is described with some detail, and that detail is important for us. To begin with, he is described as being wrapped in a cloud. We need to realize, if we haven't already picked this up from all of our reading of Scripture in both the Old and the New Testaments, this is a God thing. God is often described in this way. God comes to interact with his people in the clouds and wrapped in the clouds. Psalm 18, the end of the book of Job, so many other places where God is described as coming in this way. Of course, Jesus too, who, not coincidentally, is God, is described as having ascended in the clouds. And the angel who spoke to the apostles who watched him ascend on that day said, "Don't, don't stand around here gazing into heaven. This same Jesus will come again in the same way that you have seen him go. So in Revelation chapter 21, we were, or chapter 1, I'm sorry, we were told, behold, he is coming with the clouds. So that might be a bit of a clue as to who this mighty angel in chapter 10 is or represents. But the mighty angel is also described as having a rainbow over his head. And again, this is a description that needs to draw our thoughts back to the throne of God. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, we read, And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne there was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Now, that's the throne of God in chapter 4. In chapter 5, the lamb is described as being in the midst of the throne. Again, if anybody ever tries to tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God, don't believe them. This whole book of Revelation, as it unfolds Jesus Christ for us, over and over and over again makes the point that the Son and the Father are one, that Jesus Christ is God. That is a non-negotiable. Anyone who says Jesus Christ is not God, according to John in another book, is an antichrist. And we have to hold that in mind. So just the fact that Jesus is in the midst of the throne and this rainbow surrounds the throne. Well, in Ezekiel chapter 1, we saw something similar. He was describing his vision of God. Down, downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So you can almost use your imagination a little bit here and think of the lamb in the midst of the throne and the rainbow, the the bow that surrounds the throne, which is the glory of God. And as the lamb descends to the earth, or as this mighty angel descends to the earth, what has been a bow around him becomes a, a, a crown over his head. Furthermore, his face was like the sun, just like the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, where we read his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. 
And just like on the mountain of transfiguration as well, where Peter, James, and John accompanied Jesus to the top of the mountain, and he was transfigured before him, they saw him in his kingdom glory. He had said just before that, there are some standing here who will not die until they have seen the Son of Man in the glory, in his glory. And then they went up on the mountain and they saw him and his face shone like the sun. Add to all of this his legs like Pillars of fire, again, a description that we see of God in Ezekiel and Revelation and other places. And the fact that he had a little scroll open in his hand. Now, if you can remember all the way back to chapter 5, the events of that, John is witnessing God seated on his throne in the heavenly temple. And then he notices a lamb standing as if slain who goes to God, the Father, seated on his throne and receives from his hand a scroll that's sealed with seven seals. Now, prior to that, John had been weeping because the angel had asked, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? Well, now this mighty angel descends and he has a little scroll open in his hand. And it begs for the question, is this mighty angel another appearance of Jesus? Well, we can say definitely, maybe, <laughs> could be. A few weeks back, Pastor Paul Verhoof preached from a text in the book of Genesis which featured the patriarch Jacob wrestling through the night with someone who in the book of Genesis was described as simply a man. Now, commonly... We speak of Jacob wrestling with an angel because speaking of the event in Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, the prophet wrote, In the womb, he, Jacob, took his brother by the heel, and in his manhood he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. And even when that wrestling match was over in the book of Genesis, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Another incident in Genesis has Abraham sitting in front of his tent one day, and he looks up, and three men are approaching. And by the end of that encounter, Abraham, who is talking to those three men, is calling them Yahweh. He's calling them Lord. He's acknowledging that these men are so much more than men. Angels of the Lord, perhaps just incarnate appearances of God himself. So is this angel in Revelation 10 Jesus? Well, God has been known to do that. God has been known in his interactions with his creation to appear as angels. So maybe, does this angel at least represent Jesus in this vision? Absolutely. Absolutely. If we simply start with what we know and we consider the attributes attributed to this angel in the description, then we have to agree with one commentator who wrote, enough has been seen to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that this rainbow haloed cloud clothed angel coming down out of heaven is or represents the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's about to happen what this angel is about to do is done with all of the authority of the triune God. This angel, with a little scroll open in his hand, set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now again, the word for land here is ge, sometimes translated unnecessarily as earth in some versions. It's really important in this context because when this being, this angel who is or represents Jesus in this vision takes his stand with one foot on the sea and the other on the land, he is, to begin with, laying claim to the whole of the created world, the totality, totality of terrestrial things, as one author has written. But in the book of Revelation, there's more to it than that. In the book of Revelation, this formula, sea and land, usually represents not only the created order, the, the literal sea and the literal land, it more often represents the land of Israel, the people of God, and the chaos of the Gentile world. Very often, the word that's used in Greek is the word for abyss. 
and sea or abyss or chaos. It all kind of connects together in this way. So this angel, it's not just a mere detail that he takes his stand on the land and on the sea. It's important because in weeks to come, we're going to see some beasts arise out of the land and out of the sea. And it's important to have this in the background. Because when this mighty angel takes his stand with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, representing the Lord Jesus Christ, he is laying claim to the whole of the earth and to the people of God and to the nations. In Psalm 2, I know I go to this a lot, but it's just so important in our understanding of Scripture itself. The Father says, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. And that verse is specifically applied in the book of Acts to the resurrection of, the, of Jesus from the dead. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. And now this mighty angel who represents Jesus descends from the throne of God, and he takes his stand on the land and on the sea, and he claims his inheritance. And he called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring, maybe like the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah, because the lamb is the lion, and the lion is the Lord. And as so many times in the Psalms and in other passages of Scripture, the voice of the Lord is like thunder. So when he calls out like a lion roaring, the seven thunders sounded. And John tells us that when the seven thunders had sounded, he was about to write. He was going to write down what the thunders said. But he heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. In spite of the fact that God said, seal up what the thunders have written, so many people feel compelled to speculate on what the thunders have written. We are not going to do that. It's not a good thing. The secret things belong to God, the things that have been written down to us and to our children. I think David Chilton was right when he wrote, the message was intended for St. John's ears only. It was not intended for the church at large. If it had been intended for the church at large, God would have let him write it down. But what's important here is the fact that God wanted John to record what he was not supposed to reveal. That he was not not supposed to reveal whatever the seven thunders said. God wanted the church to know He wanted us to know that there are some things, many things, actually, that God has no intention of telling us beforehand. And we ought not pry into those things. More importantly than what did John write down? He wrote for us in verse 5, And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. Now, remember, this angel has a little scroll. I, I don't have a scroll handy, but... You know, the posture here takes one foot on the land, another foot on the sea. He's got the little scroll in his left hand because he raises his right hand to heaven. Think of a public official taking an oath of office with his left hand on the Bible and his right hand raised. Or think of a witness in a court of law and then you have the right idea. With one hand holding the scroll, the word, the covenant of God, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, as he was described to us in chapter 1, raised his right hand and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. So this mighty angel who is or at the very least represents the Lord Jesus Christ in this vision takes an oath. He swears with all the authority of God himself and he swears by God himself, which is significant because the writer of the Hebrews tells us that when God made a promise to Abraham because there was no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. God doesn't need any external authorities to 
call to bear witness to his truthfulness. He swears by himself and he keeps his promises. So here God the Son who cannot lie swears by God the Father, the one who created heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it. In other words, the God who created the whole universe, the universe that he has just claimed. And very specifically he swears that there would be no more delay. Now that seems like an odd sort of oath to take in this setting but back in chapter 6 as we noted when the lamb opened the fifth seal the saints and martyrs were told to wait a little longer just rest wait until the number of your fellow servants and your brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been just wait and now there will be no more delay The very thing for which the saints of God had prayed will be brought to pass. Even so, the oath proclaims that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, which all sounds very mysterious, almost apocalyptic, prophetic, things like that. But the thing is, when the New Covenant Scripture uses this term, mystery, it uses it in a very specific context. We sing that song, you know, and adoring bend the knee while we own the mystery. We're we're using it a little differently there. We're saying we understand that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the three are one, and the one essence is expressed in three persons. We just don't know exactly how that could be because the math doesn't work in our heads. So we're saying there's there's a mystery there that we can't penetrate. We just declare by faith that this is the truth. But when scripture uses this word mystery, it's using it in a different context. It's using it in the sense of something that had been hidden in the past, which is now revealed. Now we use it in that way too. Um, I have been known from time to time to read a mystery novel, and the best ones are the ones you can't figure out as you're working your way through the story. I mean, I I don't know if any of you have read, and then there were none, I think it was originally called Ten Little Indians by Agatha Christie, and you know, these ten people go to this island, and one by one they begin to die, and of course you're thinking, well, the, the last one standing is the one who's guilty, and then the last one standing ends up dying too, and if you're, unless, I mean, most of you probably are smarter than me, but at that point when I'm reading this book for the first time, I'm thinking, that really, that's horrible. You know? And then there's a note in a bottle, if I remember, that gets fished up out of the sea that explains how this all came to be. So you do find out in the final chapter who done it. But that's what a mystery is. Something that was hidden. Something that was not revealed, which is now revealed. And that's what we want. And what is the mystery of God? Well, in one respect, the whole book of Revelation, go figure, Revelation, is the revelation of the mystery of God. But for a more concise definition, and one that's a little bit easier for us to understand, we could turn to Ephesians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul wrote... When you read this, when you read this letter to the Ephesians, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. So there it is. That's the exact definition of mystery. Something that had not been made known, but is now revealed, and in this case revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. There it is. It has now been revealed, and this is the mystery. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. See, all the way through the Old Covenant, and, and actually it was kind of revealed there too, but all the way through, 
that old covenant scripture, the people of Israel had thought, we are God's people. We have a song we sing like that. Um, but they were singing it, we are God's people. And you Gentiles, <laughs> you're not. You're dogs. You're outsiders. You don't belong with us. But the mystery then is essentially the church, the kingdom of God. In the previous chapter of Ephesians, Paul had written, and this is what he's saying, you will understand my insight when you read it. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. So we're talking about people who are physically Jewish, Israelites, descendants of Abraham, and people who are physically not. And he's speaking to those who were not, that is to us, to our forebearers anyway. He says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. And if all of that wasn't enough to shake us up, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. There's the blood of Christ again. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So there were kind of two aspects to this mystery. First of all, that the Gentiles were going to be included. And not only that, but that when the Gentiles were included, they would not be included through conversion and proselytization to Israel and the Old Covenant, but they would be included as Christ brought Jew and Gentile together in himself, in his body, and this bringing together, this summing up of all things in Christ, to borrow an expression from the Colossians, is the substance of the whole of Revelation and of the mystery of God which was to be fulfilled in the days of the trumpet call of the seventh angel. In the days, of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. Now, we know what it is. When were those days? Well, those days, as we've seen, had been unfolding around John since the day of Pentecost, since the ascension of Jesus, really, to the right hand of the Father. There's this aspect of the Old Covenant age which is brought to its end in Christ, but definitively at the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. So there's also this overlapping of the age to come and the old age in the way that Scripture comes together for us in the New Covenant. Douglas Wilson gives good insight on this writing. As long as the temple in Jerusalem stood, there would be standing pressure for the Gentiles to become Jews as part of becoming Christians. About a third of the book of Acts is dealing with exactly that conflict. Do Gentiles who come to Christ need to come by way of the old covenant law? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to come to the temple and begin to offer the sacrifices that are required of God's people? This was the first great controversy of the first generation in the church, Wilson goes on, and that controversy would continue as long as the temple continued. The dominant identity of the church was going to be Jewish as long as the temple remained. And that's how it worked out in practical terms, in Acts of the Apostles, and even in the Epistles. We might remember the occasion for the book of Galatians, is that Peter is in Antioch, and he's content to sit with the Gentile believers and to eat with them, up to a point when some men, allegedly anyway, came from James, and then suddenly Peter begins to withdraw from the Gentiles, as if they're still unclean, 
because they're not circumcised according to the law of Moses. And Paul says, when I saw that he was in the wrong, I opposed him to his face. I'd like to be a fly at the wall or on the wall at that confrontation with the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and the apostle Peter, the apostle to the Jews, having this face-off where Paul says, Peter, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And you need to acknowledge that you're wrong. Galatians 2 is mostly about Paul's speech to Peter on that occasion. But even with Peter, the dominant identity of the church in his mind was still as some sort of a a faction or some sort of a splinter group of Judaism. But the angel who in this vision either is or represents Jesus stands and swears, he takes an oath that when the kingdom has been fully transferred from the old covenant people to the new, and this is exactly what Jesus predicted, In Matthew 21, when Jesus was speaking, he gave that parable of the vineyard. And he told about how God had sent the servants, the prophets, and the people had put them to death and chased them away and stoned them and so forth. And then he said, I will send my son. And the people said, here's the heir. Let's kill him. And then the vineyard will be ours. So they killed him. Jesus asked them a question at that point. He said, what do you think the owner of that vineyard is going to do to those people who killed his son? And they passed the test. They got it right. Many people today don't, but they did. The Pharisees to whom Jesus was speaking said, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And Jesus said, exactly Have you never heard the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I tell you the truth, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. And that's what was happening in the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, in Pentecost when God sent his spirit and said, these are my people, the ones that I have sealed with my Holy Spirit and have chosen for myself. In the subsequent diminishing of everything that that the the apostles and, and the people of the old covenant held dear, The Olivet Discourse, which fits right in here with this, happened on the occasion when Jesus and his disciples are walking out past that magnificent temple complex. And his disciples turn to Jesus a little later. Or no, they turn to him as they're walking by, and they said, see these buildings? Isn't this wonderful? What an amazing thing God has wrought in giving this temple to his people. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, a day is coming when not one stone will be left upon another. So a little while later, on top of the Mount of Olives, they came to Jesus and they said, tell us, when will this be? When will not one stone be left upon another? And Jesus tells them. He tells them it's coming. It's coming soon. It's coming in this generation. And when you see it, get out and get away. As long as the temple stood, there was going to be this tension between Jew and Gentile. But once the temple had fallen, once it had been removed, once that sacrificial system that the writer to the Hebrews said was obsolete, it was obsolete because Jesus had already offered himself one sacrifice for all on the cross. And it was near to disappearing because within just a few years of the writing of the book of Hebrews, Jerusalem would essentially be bulldozed by the Roman armies. This Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, is saying in the days when the seventh trumpet sounds, I'm going to be bringing people to God, not through the temple here on earth, but through the temple that is my body, the church the church of Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the firstborn from among the dead. This is the portrait we get of Christ in Revelation chapter 10, but this portrait's not quite 
finished. Having seen the mighty angel, having heard the oath and the words spoken by the seven thunders, John writes, then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, go, take this scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And having heard that instruction, John goes on, so I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. Of course, that same thing had been said of Old Covenant Scripture too. We often overlook this because we think law and gospel. Well, law is bad. Gospel is good. The writing of the law in Psalm 119 and other places in Scripture, the psalmist said, your law is like honey. It's sweeter than honey. It's more precious than gold. It's amazing. And Ezekiel had had a very similar experience. You can read about it in chapters 2 and 3 of his prophecy, where a book is given to him, and he's told, eat this book, eat this scroll. And he's told the scroll is going to be sweet in his mouth when he consumes the word of God, the covenant of God. It will be sweet in his mouth. Now John is told that in spite of that, it's going to be bitter in his gut in his stomach, in his heart. Ezekiel relates just a few verses after he was told to eat. In Ezekiel 3.14, the spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And in each case, Ezekiel and John, the reason for the bittersweet nature of the experience is the same because the word of the Lord is the same. It is sweet sweeter than honey when we consider that it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The word of God is sweet, but it's also bitter when we consider the fact that there are many who will not believe, that there are many who love darkness rather than light. And so the gospel goes out as this sweet proclamation of salvation to everyone who will hear and repent and turn to God through faith in Jesus Christ. But there's a bitter aspect when we consider that that same message, the message of the gospel that brings salvation to the people of God, is a message of impending judgment to those who reject him. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, the apostle says of the name of Jesus. So how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. But to an unbeliever, the message of the gospel is a message of judgment. John had this same experience, discovering the bitterness, because as he's proclaiming this message, he's proclaiming the destruction of a city that had been just so integral to his life and to that temple complex where he had worshipped God throughout his life. And there's more judgment to come. But it's sweet. And John was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Thing is, that is more than merely Jesus' commission to John. It's a commission that was given in a very specific time and place in a very specific historic context. But it's more than that. It was his commission to all of his apostles. You know the one from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's also in the book of John, in the gospel according to John, when he met with his disciples in the upper room, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he said, as the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. Now the disciples might have been clever enough at that point to stop and think, as the Father sent him, he is sending us, and look, Kind of how, I mean, we know how it turned out, but look what he had to go through to get to that point. And then he equips them. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus called and equipped his disciples that day, he calls and equips his disciples today. 
And he sends us out into the world to proclaim in word and deed this bitter, sweet, good news. Calling, as Paul said in Acts 17, all people everywhere to repent. That's what the gospel does. It calls all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. But before we can proclaim the message, in deed or in word, we must receive it. We must receive it from the hand of the lion who is the lamb, who is the Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, and the firstborn from among the dead. Let's pray. Father, as you speak to us by your word and spirit, breathe on us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and send us out empowered to proclaim the gospel, which is your power for salvation to everyone who will believe. Help us to do that, Father, as individuals, wherever you give us opportunity as the church, existing in a community, making this proclamation together. Help us to do it with the words that we say and help us to do it, Lord, in the deeds that we do, that people may see any good thing that we may do and give glory not to us, but to you, our Father in heaven, to whom alone is due all glory and honor and praise. Help us to receive your word, Father, and then send us out to proclaim it. We pray in the name of the living word, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Crown him with many crowns. at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And all God's people said.
go then in peace to love and serve the Lord our God.